Good morning and welcome to the Baptist Voice. Let me start our program off this morning by wishing everyone a Merry Christmas on the behalf of the folks at the Bible Baptist Church. Today is Christmas Day and let me just remind us of what this day means. Now, I read a recent poll where 51% said, and I, and I may not be extremely accurate here, but I think I'm pretty accurate on what I read. 51% of the people stated that Christmas was some sort of a religious holiday or that it was a religious holiday. And then there was about 38% that said it's a cultural holiday. And then there were 9% in that survey that said that um, they weren't sure exactly what it means and a certain percentage says they didn't care. And then a certain percentage said that Christmas means absolutely nothing. It's just a normal day. Well, biblically speaking, Christmas is the acknowledgement from humanity to Godward. It's something that you and I acknowledge to our Creator, being thankful that He so loved each of us that He gave His only begotten Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ was given to die for our sin so that we can have a relationship with a holy God. He came, died on the cross. You know that. They buried him in the grave. What happened on the third day? I didn't hear you. What happened on the third day? That's right. He rose again and he is alive today. And because he lives today, Jesus Christ alone has the authority and he is in a position by our creator as God's son to grant and to give to all who will come unto him, the greatest gift known unto man. And that is the gift of never dying. The gift of eternal life. The gift of living in heaven forever and ever and ever with God. So we thank the Lord for this great gift of salvation in the Lord Jesus Christ. Today we're going to continue our short sermon series that we've been bringing you on the radio. This is message number four, and it's titled, The Crowning of Jesus Christ. We've talked about the coming of Jesus Christ, the confirming of Jesus Christ as the King of the world, the commencement of Jesus Christ, and why he did all his miracles. And today we will conclude the crowning of Jesus Christ. Now, today, once again, is Christmas Day. Now, let's just suppose that for some reason, your church is not having services. We at the Bible Baptist Church are having our normal scheduled services. So if you're looking for a place to go to Christmas services at today, this morning our Sunday school starts at just about an hour at 10 o'clock. It's 9 o'clock now. And then, well, depending on where you're listening to us at, some of our radio audience is listening. It's 8 o'clock. And that even gives you more time. So we have our Sunday school program at 10 o'clock a.m., more time for what? To get ready and come with us this morning. And then church this morning starts at 11 o'clock a.m., normal services. And then tonight we will assemble together again at 6.30 like we always do. I do realize it's Christmas, but I do realize today, or at least this year, it falls upon the first day of the week, and God is to have the preeminence and everything concerning the church. So we try to keep our structure exactly as we feel it should be biblically. So if you don't have a place this morning to go and serve and, and participate in a church service, you're more than welcome to be with us at the Bible Baptist Church. We are just right outside of the greater Cincinnati, northern Kentucky area, maybe 20, 25 minutes from greater Cincinnati, 20 minutes from the Florence, Kentucky area, one, listen, the very first exit off of I-275, as soon as you cross the bridge from Kentucky, we are just three sixteenths of a mile right there off of I-275, right on Route 50, extremely easy to find. You're welcome to be with us. This morning, how about going to Revelation chapter 19? Let's go ahead and conclude today's message um, with the short series that we have been preaching the last three weeks with the title, The Crowning of the Lord Jesus Christ. Revelations chapter number 19. Now verse number 12. In the context of Revelation chapter 19, verse 11 through 16 is an event that has not happened yet, but is going to happen. 
and we would call this the second coming, the literal, physical second coming, the Olivet Discourse of God's Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And in verse 12, I just want you to see, we got a picture here of heaven being open and a white horse, and there is one setting on that horse, and that one setting is God's Son, Jesus Christ. Here he is called faithful and true. And in verse 12, the Bible says, as a description of Christ, his eyes were as a flame of fire. Now watch. And on his head were many crowns. Many crowns. And we're talking today about the crowning of the Lord Jesus Christ. Throughout history, there has been many different points of established thought and fact that Christ has done that give him the title, the King of Kings. All kings wear a crown. Here we find on the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ that he has many crowns. So far, we have talked about the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, and we were dealing with the incarnation, otherwise known as the mystery of godliness. That is that God, our creator, who is spirit, was manifest in the flesh, in the person of of God's Son, Jesus Christ. Now, I know there are religious groups that reject the incarnation, but they're wrong. They are not believing what the Bible clearly teaches, and they are rejecting clear Bible truth from the idea of another. You cannot but help believe the incarnation and embrace it by reading the Bible. For someone to say there is no such thing as God coming into earth and visiting humanity in the form of a man by the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, for someone to come to that conclusion, they have been taught that by a man. It is not what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches that God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, received up into glory. Jesus Christ was full man, and he was full God. This, as we've already talked about three weeks ago, was made po four weeks ago, was made possible by the incarnation that is God himself becoming a man to communicate a divine message number two we've talked about the confirming of this that Jesus Christ as a young child was confirmed king of kings and remember we talked about the wise men who came from the east and they brought gold and they offered it to Christ a young child and remember gold is a picture of sovereignty. It's a picture of power and authority. And them wise men, by offering gold unto Jesus Christ as a young child, were authenticating. This is the sovereign one. This is the promised one, the prophesied one. This is the one in whom the prophets have prophesied about. Now the prophecy has been fulfilled. This is the king of the world, the king of the Jews. They offer as well frankincense. Frankincense was used in the temple exclusively as a means of prayer and worship. And by the wise men offering frankincense, they were showing worship to Jesus Christ. And God's the only one to be worshipped. And Jesus Christ is God. Throughout the Bible, the New Testament, we see that Jesus Christ was worshipped. Okay, and that, by the way, was not rejected. That was welcomed. And then, if you'll recall, the wise men offered myrrh. And myrrh was an embalming. And it was it was something that the wise men offered that were recognizing that this king, this young child that has been born and brought into the world, would die for the sins of the world. And he would resurrect because you got to be living to be a king and control a kingdom. So it's a great story, biblical story, about the confirming of the Lord Jesus Christ and what the wise men did there. And then we talked last week about the commencement of Jesus Christ, and that was his ministry, the starting of his ministry, the length of his ministry. About three, three and a half years, Jesus Christ performed about 34 to 33 miracles that proved that only God could do what he did. No man has ever been able to be an equal to Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ authenticated his messiahship, his sonship, and his coming by his personal work. The very works that Christ did authenticate him as being the Messiah. Now today, we're going to talk about 
the crowning of the Lord Jesus Christ. So towards the end of the ministry of Jesus Christ, towards the end of his three, three and a half years, what took place? Well, first of all, I'd like to look at just that last week, if you will, at Gethsemane. The garden. There was a garden that Jesus, the Bible says, resorted to oftentimes to pray. And in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 26, I want to read to you starting at verse number 36 to 39. First of all, we want to look at the garden and Gethsemane. So here we find in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 26 and verse 36, then come a Jesus with them, and that would have been Peter, James, and John. Then come a Jesus with them unto a place called Gethsemane, and saith unto his disciples, Set ye here while I go and pray yonder. Now keep in mind, what is getting ready to take place here in the life of Jesus Christ? He's getting ready to be nailed to the cross. He's getting ready to die. He knows all things. Now keep in mind, Jesus Christ was full man. He could die. But he was also full God. He rose again, and death could not overpower or overtake him, being perfect. Now watch, verse 37. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, James and John, and began to be sorrowful and very heavy. Think about this. The sin of of every man that's ever been committed, the sin of every woman that's ever been committed is about to be laid upon. Now think about this. You know the burden of sin. When you do something wrong, doesn't it bother you? Doesn't it weigh on you? Won't it take your sleep away from you and make you not eat? Won't it break you? I mean, people who are um, controlled by sin, does not that sin wear on their lives and take life away from them? Don't they at 30 look like they're 60? And I'm not trying to put anybody down. I'm just saying this is what sin does. Sin is a serious burden. Now, all of this of the world is about to be laid upon Jesus. And look how he is. He says he began to be sorrowful and very heavy. His countenance changed. His steps were heavy. Now, listen. Then saith he unto them, My soul is exceeding sorrowful, even unto death. Death was putting its grip on him. He says, Tarry ye here and watch with me. Now watch. Verse 39. And he, that's Jesus Christ, went a little further and fell on his face. The weight of sin had overcome him. He was pushed down to the ground. And sin does that. It overcomes and it pushes us down. And he went a little further and fell on his face and prayed saying, Oh, my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. Here in the garden, Gethsemane, we see Christ faced with temptation like nobody has ever experienced. Great temptation. The greatest temptation. You know, it may be one thing to resist something when everything's easy, but how about when it's bad? You know, in the Gospel of John, chapter 15, verse 13, Jesus said, let me go over there and quote this to you, and I want you to think about this in conjunction of what we're trying to show you. And I'm trying to show you, first of all, that Jesus was crowned king at Gethsemane. He overcame life's temptation. All of it. All of it. Now, verse number 13 of John chapter 15 says, the words of Jesus Christ, greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. What is Jesus Christ about to do here? Lay down his life for his friends? Yes. But also for those who would reject him mock him, laugh at him, spit on him, claim him to be a phony, and say that there is no such thing as Jesus Christ, the Son of God. You think of the great temptation here. Would you do it? Would you die for a man who took a family member? You would not. Would you give your life for someone who took the life of your son? You would not. 
think about this moment. What I'm saying is this. The love that Jesus Christ had for man in general, his love for you, overcame the temptation to pass the cup. Jesus said, if it be possible, Father, let this cup pass from me. What cup? The cup of bitter death. The cup that had all the sin of the world in it. The cup that had every sin that you've ever committed in it. A poisonous cup. A sickening cup. A cup that ruins the lives of people. Jesus took in that sin. He took that cup by the handle and drank that bitter cup for you. Think about this at Gethsemane. This is setting the scene to our next thought, Golgotha. So here he is at Gethsemane overcoming temptation that I could never even think about. But he had to overcome this temptation in order to give me victory over my sin. And my sin is a result of being tempted and giving in to my temptations. Golgotha. So a little bit further, we move on in Matthew chapter number 27, and we find starting in verse number 33. Now keep in mind, Jesus has been arrested while he's at the Garden of Gethsemane. Um, it was just a short time after that. Judas came. He was a phony. Judas was acting like a disciple. He was a liar. He was a betrayer. He sold Jesus out. He turns him over to the authorities. The authorities try to find fault with him. They rise up against him false witnesses they put people together who were in jail and they said we're going to let you out of jail if you'll give us a statement about this man of what you heard just a very crooked political system in that day like we see and witness from time to time in our own day and so he has been before Pilate they have traded Barabbas for Jesus Barabbas was a criminal and Barabbas has been released <sighs> And then Jesus Christ is being sentenced to death. Verse 33. And when they were come unto a place called Golgotha, that is to say a place of a skull, they gave him vinegar to drink mingled with gall. And when he had tasted thereof, he would not drink. And they crucified him and parted his garments, casting lots, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet they parted my garments among them, and upon my vesture did they cast lots. And sitting down, they watched him there. And they set up over his head his accusation written, This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Then were there two thieves crucified with him, one on the right hand and another on the left. And as they passed by, and, the, and they that passed by reviled him, saying, or wagging their heads, saying, Thou that destroyest the temple and buildest it in three days, save thyself. If thou be the Son of God, come down from the cross. Likewise also the chief priest mocking him. With the scribes and elders said, He saved others. Himself he cannot save. If he be the king of Israel, let him now come down from the cross, and we will believe him. He trusted in God. Let him deliver him now. If he will have him, for he said, I am the Son of God. The thieves also, which were crucified with him, cast the same in his teeth. Now, from the sixth hour there was darkness over all the land until the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama shabastani. That is to say, my God, my God. Why hast thou forsaken me? Some of them that stood there when they heard that said, This man called for Elias. And straightway one of them ran and took a sponge and filled it with vinegar and put it on a reed and gave him the drink. And the rest said, Let be, let us see whether Elias will come to save him. Jesus, when he had cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost. What's taking place here on Golgotha? Jesus is dying for Barabbas. Substitutionary death. Jesus is dying for a sinful man. Barabbas was a robber. He was a murderer. And Jesus was exchanged for such. Let me say it like this. Jesus was being exchanged for a sinner. That's what took place on the cross for you and I. 
If you do not have the manlyhood to confess and admit that you're a sinner, then you cannot embrace the salvation of Jesus Christ. Why you point your long fingers at others saying they're sinners, not I, you are a condemned man. Listen, 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 18 says, For Christ also hath once suffered for sins. That was at Golgotha. The just for the unjust. Pilate said, I find no fault in him, and there was no fault in him. The death of Christ on the cross was the just, that's Jesus Christ, the perfect Son of God, for the unjust, that's Barabbas. You know who Barabbas is? Me. You know who Barabbas is? You. We are Barabbas. Watch this. For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God. Being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. This is dealing with the substitutionary death of God's Son, Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ on Golgotha died for you. Whether you will acknowledge that or not now, one day you will. Listen to this preacher. Don't you trust what men tell you apart from the Bible. You can trust the Bible. The Bible says that one day every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. If you don't do that now, when you do it later, it'll be too late. You will die in your sins and you will be eternally separated from God in the lake of fire. Sin is heavy, it's poison, and it destroys life. The grace that God offers in Jesus Christ is light, it's liberty, it's forgiveness, and gives you eternal life with God. It's your choice. When Jesus was nailed to the cross and died on Golgotha, it was there he died in the place of Barabbas the just for the unjust, that he might bring you unto God. And without Christ, you cannot come unto God, regardless of who you are and what you've done. You will not be welcomed into the presence of your Creator apart from accepting the substitutionary death of God's Son. Christ suffered for sins, your sin, and my sin was included in that suffering that he might bring us to God. The Bible says, but God commended his love towards you and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. There he is, king of Gethsemane, overcoming life's greatest temptation. There he is on the cross, king of the Jews, they say above him, overcoming death for every man, the poison of sin. And there he is at the grave. Because the Bible says he died, and he did die. And if we went back to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter number 28, Jesus died. They took him off the grave. They buried him. They said it's all over. We don't have to mess with this man no more, nor face, nor deal, nor hear him. Little did they know something great was to take place. And Matthew, chapter number 28, verse number 1, in the end of the Sabbath, as it began the dawn toward the first day of the week, that's Sunday, came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to see the scepter. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat upon it. His countenance was like lightning, and his raiment white as snow. And for fear of him the keepers did shake and became as dead men. And the angel answered and said unto the women, Fear not ye, for I know that ye seek Jesus which was crucified. Listen to this. He is not here, for he is risen. As he said, Come, see the place where the Lord lay. And go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead. And behold, he go up before you into Galilee. There shall ye see him. And lo, I have told you. And they did depart quickly from the scepter with fear and great joy and did run to bring the disciples word and guess what they found they found jesus what does this mean jesus christ when he was at gethsemane he overcame life's greatest temptation when he was at golgotha he died for 
our sin, substitutionary death, that he might bring us unto God. He rose from the grave so that you can be justified, so that you can be forgiven. Listen to Romans chapter 4, verse 25, in reference to Jesus Christ, who was delivered for our offenses. That is, Jesus Christ was delivered unto Pilate and died on the cross at Golgotha, the place of the skull, for your sin and my sin, who was delivered for our offenses, but listen, and was raised again for our justification. That means that the grave is empty. Jesus conquered it. He rose from it. And because he lives today, he has the power to instill in your life justification and make you perfect. The word justification broken down means just as if I'd never sinned or making or being made just and right. This is what must take place in your life if you're going to have a relationship with your creator. Your creator is holy. Jesus Christ rose from the grave. The Bible says he is seated on the right hand of the throne of God and he is right now to appear in the presence of God for you, according to Hebrews chapter 9, verse 24. That, as Peter said in 1 Peter 3, 18, he might bring us unto God. Now, Jesus Christ, as we said, is coming back one day, and he's coming back soon. On his head, as Revelations 19, 12 states, will be many crowns. I know of at least three. There's a crown over great temptation. Temptation never took Jesus Christ he triumphed over all temptation. There's a crown there. At Golgotha, he tasted death for every man. He gave his life. It was the just for the unjust. There's a crown there. And then at the grave, travel there today in Jerusalem, and you will find the grave is empty. There is justification. My dear friends, salvation is for you today. Christmas is about the crowning work of the Lord Jesus Christ and his life, and what he can instill and bring and put in your life. The greatest gift that you can receive this Christmas season is the gift of eternal life that's found only in God's Son, Jesus Christ. Now listen, are you saved this morning? If you're not saved, you can be saved right where you're at right now by listening to the Bible. The Bible says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Can you admit that? The Bible says there is none righteous, no, not one, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The Bible says for the wage of sin is death. Can you confess and admit to God your creator this morning that you have broken one of the commandments? I know everybody has. Don't worry about everybody. We're talking about you. Can you confess and admit to God this morning that you have been, say, you have been sinful and you have sinned? Secondly, God loves you and God has provided the means of all your sin to be forgiven. That's what Golgotha was about. That's what the grave's about. Listen, Jesus died for your sin. He died for you, Barabbas. Where are you at today, Barabbas? He died for you. Can you accept by faith the greatest fact in the world that Jesus Christ died on the cross at Calvary for your sin? It's a recorded th thought of history. It's the most stated known fact in the universe. Can you believe that Jesus died for your sin? God sent Jesus to die for you so that you could be made perfect, so that you could be justified. Do you believe that on the third day he rose again? He did. He did rise again. Where is he at today? You don't know where his body is. They tried to say they came and took him by night. That was a lie. They tried to say he never died on the cross, but he kept on living and had a royal family. That's a lie. Where is he at? I tell you where he's at. He's in my heart. And he's here with us this morning. And he wants to give unto you eternal life. Jesus Christ is alive. He's not in that grave. And the Bible gives you a simple promise. Whether you're sitting in your kitchen, your living room, driving down the road, in your garage, listen to this simple Bible promise. It'll make all the difference in your life to come. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That means any man or any woman that asked Jesus Christ for salvation will be granted it. If you can believe by faith that you have sinned against God and broken a commandment, if you can believe by faith that Jesus died for your sin, if you can believe by faith that he was buried in a grave and on the third day rose again, right where you're at right now, ask Jesus. Say, Jesus, come into my heart. Forgive my sin. I acknowledge you and claim you as my Lord and Savior. Save me. Based on Romans 10, 13, and he'll save you.
The greatest gift that you can have, that we can have, is the gift of eternal life in God's Son. My dear friend, Merry Christmas. God bless you, and may God bless America.